of you that can, we surely recommend it, that you wear a mask. You know, it's kind, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if it's raining out there and two people are standing out there without umbrellas, they're both going to get wet. If one has an umbrella, the other one don't, just one of them gets wet. But both of them have an umbrella, then they're both protected from getting wet. And that's the whole idea about the mask. When both people are wearing masks, it does increase the likelihood of stopping any transmission. When only one does, you know, if that person's one with the virus, it helps. But if uh, the other person that has the virus does not, then it endangers others. So, but we're not, but we also know that not everybody can do this and not everybody can do it all day long because I don't know about you, it gets hot. <laughs> it gets hot. So, ever so often, lift it up, breathe, whatever you have to do in doing this. So, I'm glad to be back up here with everybody. I never left, that's right. I was speaking to ghost. <laughs> I have no idea who was out there. So, virtual my virtual congregation. So I am certainly glad to be back. Amen. How exciting it is indeed. All right. Today we are going to talk about Shabbat. A very important uh, moed, or as King James says, feast of the Lord. It's not a feast like you would eat and have dinner or something like that. It means moed in Hebrew but it means appointments of God. God set appointments with the seven feasts. And actually there are other Moads too, but the, there's the Pacific ones in the spring and the fall that, that, that certainly has fulfillment through Yeshua or going to have fulfillment through Yeshua. For instance, he died on Passover. He was buried on unleavened bread. He rose from the dead on the barley first fruits. So these are all Moeds in Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy that says that must be celebrated. So after the barley first fruits, 50 days later, Shavuot came about. And that's when the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples and, and began the filling the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we all are aware of today. We're still waiting on the fall feast. You know, the... the, uh, the uh, Day of shouting, some people call it the Day of Trumpets. Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles. Those are yet to be fulfilled. We're looking for, that's what will be fulfilled when he comes back. Probably beginning with the sign of the Son of Man. And then those three fall feasts will be fulfilled at that time. God has got this all planned out. Do you know that? Do you understand this? He's got it planned out. Even down to the timetable. You know, the exact times, he's got it planned out. The problem is, is we can't figure out what those timetables are. But we get an idea. We get an idea about them when, when they occur. And so people are always looking and trying to figure out the time frames. And I'm sure there are people out there today that are, are even already on the internet saying that, you know, the, the, uh, the rapture is going to occur this fall. They're talking about stuff like that. Every year, there's always people saying that. And I always tell everybody, not, don't believe those people. There are certain things that must happen before the rapture occurs and it hasn't happened yet. And those people will be willing to fight you over it because they've come fully convinced in their mind that this is it. I even had a gentleman one time in the middle of the service jump up and say, No, it's happening this fall. Well, it didn't happen. And so, so we never saw him again. <laughs> and that's what happens when people are just so certain that this is it. This is what is going to happen. And I've, and I've mentioned this many times before. For the rapture to occur, there has to be a temple or at least a tabernacle tent in Jerusalem. The beast of Revelation has to be here. There has to be a great martyrism of the martyrs taking place. So there's a lot of things that still has to happen. We're seeing it. We're seeing signs of it. We're seeing it moving that way. But it's not here yet. So we don't want to get caught up and, you know, and so don't, don't be worrying about practicing your rapture jumps just yet. It's not coming yet. You need to be concentrating on being right with the Lord and serving the Lord and understanding what his word says. That's what you need to be doing now, not worrying about the rapture. And folks, if you've been around me very long, you know I've said several times, 
We will not escape persecution. We will not escape martyrism. That is coming. Now, there will be some that will not be martyred that will be raptured. But if you understand the Thessalonians said the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then those which remain will be caught up next. That word remain means survive. So when you hear the word survive, what does that connotation does that give you? It's a terrible time going on. You happen to survive, you'll be raptured alive. That means that there's some kind of terrible thing going on on the earth where the destruction of believers and killing of believers will be taking place. And I believe it's by the beast himself of Revelation. That's why he gives the mark out. You know why he gives the mark out? He's looking for you. He's trying to find you. All the rest of the world will worship him. He's not worried about those. He's trying to find the, the believers that refuse the mark. And then he'll tell the rest of the world, point them out. Where are they? Show, anybody doesn't have the mark, point them out to me. That's what that's all about. Anyway, I digress. Let's back, get back to Shavuot. <laughs> Shavuot in Hebrew means weeks. As you saw in the readings that uh, Elder Regina had, you have to count seven weeks. That counting starts at the barley first fruits. When Yeshua rose from the dead, that's when the counting starts. That's what they call the counting of the Omer. When Yeshua rose from the dead, the next day will be one, two, three. And then on the 50th day, the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples at that time. And so that's the counting that takes place. So it means weeks, a Shavuot in Hebrew. In Greek, it means Pentecost. What does Pentecost mean? It means 50. The 50 days you count. Same thing as, as it says seven weeks and tomorrow, which is 49 days plus one, 50 days. And in the Greek, it just says 50. And even in, even in Hebrew, they use the word 50 on one of the scriptures. 50 days after the barley first fruits, which is the time that Yeshua rose from the dead. So that's what Shavuot is all about. It's, it's another moed of the Lord. You count 50 from the time he wrote, rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, 50 days later, the Holy Spirit did fall down upon the disciples. And now today, the Holy Spirit is available for all who desire it. It says, you want the Holy Spirit? The scripture says, ask. Ask for it. You know, we've had a lot of people over, over the years say, I want the Holy Spirit. I want this gift. I want that. I want the Holy Spirit. And we pray for them. They pray for them. They pray for them. And it never happens. It doesn't take. Then all of a sudden, one day, they ask again, and it took. So you never know when the Lord is waiting for your heart to be right and prepared that he's going to pour the Holy Spirit out upon you. you know, don't ever be discouraged. Don't ever be discouraged about it. Keep asking and asking and asking all the time. Most of today I'm going to be talking about from Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, 15 says, And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, that's the 50 days, the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, that's the barley first fruits, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. That's seven weeks. Seven times seven is 49. The next day is one more day, 50. That's where you get that. Leviticus 23, 16 says, Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days, and you, you shall offer a new meal offering unto the Lord. A new meal offering. The previous meal offering was barley. Now it's a new meal offering. It's a wheat offering. If you understand those agricultural cycles, particularly in Israel, you know, the barley comes up first. And then the wheat is ready for harvest. It's the barley, then the wheat. Folks, understand, when God speaks in agricultural terms, he's speaking about people. Understand that shadow and that symbol in the Bible when you read it. He's talking about people. And many times when he's talking about sacrifices of burnt offerings, he's also talking about people. That's so why all these mysteries in the Bible, if you understand the right codes and understand what he's talking about, will make a whole lot more sense when it's talking about burnt offerings or agricultural terms, particularly barley and wheat meal offerings. You know, and King James says meat. It's not meat. <laughs> Where's the meat? Where's the beef? No, it's talking about grain. That's King James uses the word meat for grain. 
So it's grain, barley, and then wheat. So this new meal offering 50 days later after the barley first fruit is wheat. I've been in Israel during this time. And I'll tell you what. I was in the, in the Galilee area, and there was fields of wild wheat growing everywhere. So I cut some, and I put it and pressed it in my Bible. For a long time I had it until one day I opened up the Bible and crumbs fell out. But nonetheless, I just had to have some of that wheat right around Shavuot period. And I carried it in my Bible for quite some time until it finally disintegrated into nothing. But it was, it was amazing to see even the natural wheat uh, field. And the barley grew naturally also. So when the Hebrews first came into Israel, and they crossed the Jordan River into Israel, God says, you are to eat of the barley that grows natural in the field when you first enter the land. So they, they ate of the barley. And, uh, and then after that, uh, well, at the same time, manna ceased. So when they crossed the Jordan River and there was the barley fields, manna ceased to exist. The daily manna they had in the 40 years of wilderness stopped. God saying, okay, you're under a different time period now. It's the barley. You're going to eat the barley. And if you were with me on when we talked about first fruits and unleavened bread and all that, barley represented the, the believers of, of, of God prior to the wheat. So when Yeshua rose from the dead, it said many rose from the dead with him. It's amazing to me how many believers have no idea that scripture's in there. But look at the scriptures about Yeshua speaking. He rose from the dead. And then it said many others rose from the dead also and showed themselves to the people of Jerusalem. That's the barley first fruits rapture. That was a rapture. And now we're waiting for the wheat rapture to take place. That's the one we're all waiting for. And it's the bigger one. It's a longer one. And that's what's taking place. We're waiting for that. It doesn't tell us on the new meal offering, we know it's wheat, it doesn't tell us how much, where it tells us that in the barley, how much they are to bring to the Lord on the first fruits day. When I say bring to the Lord, that means they are to bring the barley, and the same rule applies to the wheat, you are to bring it to the priest at the altar, at the temple or the tabernacle, to be presented to God. It's called first fruits. If you don't know what first fruits is, first fruits is a part of a larger harvest you know so the, in Israel the farmers would designate a part of their field if they got 10 acres out there they're going to take 10% of that one acre and they're going to designate that as first fruits unto the Lord and when come time to harvest it they will harvest that little spot that they decided this is for God only and they'll take it to the temple and the priest will wave it before God to be accepted by God so if the grain represents people, what do you think is happening at the temple? The priest would be Yeshua. He is waving you and presenting you to God to be accepted by God the Father. That's what that's about. God truthfully doesn't care about barley. It's symbolism. The whole thing is about symbolism. So they would bring that first fruits to the temple. And it be presented to God. We do that here too in the, for, for, for Shavuot. We wave the fruit baskets. And what that fruit basket represents. So those of you going to do this online with me tomorrow. Get your baskets ready. Put in it. You can put the seven species in it if you want. The seven species uh, you know, are things like pomegranates, grapes, dates, figs, barley, wheat, olives, grapes. Those are the seven species. You can put those in your baskets if you, if you want. And then when I get ready to wave it online, you will pick your basket up and you'll wave it and do what I do. You are saying, God, here is my fruit. These are my deeds. Accept what I am presenting to you. That's what it represents is your works. You're presenting your works before God to be blessed by God and to receive the things you've done in his name. You say, well... Man, I don't, I don't want to wave everything before God. I did, there's a lot of stuff. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says, All your works will be revealed at the Bema Seat of the Messiah. 
More than likely, that's like an altar. You, all your works will be presented, even your bad stuff, even your good stuff. And people get a little upset about that. Says, well, I thought he was supposed to forgive all that stuff, throw my sins as far as east is from west into the deepest ocean. How can he be presenting my sins to me? He's not presenting your sins. Everything you ever said or did has been written down in books. And it's going to be presented. The books are going to be opened before the Messiah. And everything, your life will flash before your eyes. Everything that you ever said or did will be revealed. You know, I said, oh man, I don't want that to happen. Oh my gosh. But, and I love these buts when it comes to Yeshua. The but is Yeshua will show his love to you. No judgment. And then fire will come down. I don't know where that fire comes from. But fire will come down. And the fire will come down and it will burn up your works, all your works, right there in front of your face. And only those works that are pleasant to God, as 1 Corinthians chapter 3 speaks of, the gold and silver and precious stones will remain. But all the wood, hay, and stubble will be burned up, the bad works. You get this picture that after the fire, there's a pile of ashes then Yeshua will dig through the ashes and bring out the good things, your jewels, the wonderful things that he'll put in your crowns. But an interesting thing about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, but if a man's works are all burned up, he shall receive no reward, but he shall be saved because it was all built upon the foundation of Yeshua HaMashiach. Once you have him, you're saved, even if you did no works for him. It's important to understand when people like the thief on the cross, when Yeshua was hanging on the cross, he said, the thief said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Yeshua say to him? Today you shall be with me in paradise. That thief got saved. Forget all the goofy things people teach about that. That thief got saved that moment. He got saved. And then you have jealous believers that, well, he didn't do anything. I don't like these last minute death bed professions. It's not up to you anyway. It's up to God. But he has nothing to show for his belief. He'll be what I call a naked believer. He will have nothing to show. But those who build up works, righteous deeds, works for God. I'm not talking about man-made works or dead works. Righteous works for God. You shall receive rewards, thrones, crowns, uh, your garments of light that will shine. to be, be like this misty glow about you all the time. Some will shine like the stars and suns and some will be duller. Those are your rewards. And then positions in the kingdom. Where are you going to rank in the kingdom? So don't ever worry about those who make a de deathbed confession. Just be glad they got saved. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. Just be glad for them they got saved. But it takes nothing from us. It takes nothing from us. And all your bad works will be burnt up. That's why then it says we can boldly come before the throne of grace of God. Because Yeshua got rid of all your sin right then and there. Just like he said he would. But that's when it happens, right there. Then you are presented to the Father. Like the waving of the fruit baskets. To be received by the Father. And will the Father accept that? You better believe he'll accept anyone the Son presents to him. Amen. Be glad about that. The wicked won't even get that far, folks. The non-believers won't even get that far. They won't even come to the beam of seat of the Messiah, let alone have a basket or be presented before the Father. They will never get there. They will, no go, they will not go past go and collect $200. For those of you who know about the Monopoly game. When they die, they go straight to hell. And then they'll have to face their consequences later. Hell is not a permanent place. Hell is a temporary place place until the great white throne judgment but even then hell is thrown in the lake of fire and destroyed also so but this is the whole idea about presenting your fruits before God so prepare your baskets tomorrow 
and join with me online and let's wave the baskets together before God to be accepted. And at the same time, consider when you're building your basket, are these fruits worthy of God? Are these things worthy? You know, Yeshua even said that anyone who gives a glass of water to one of my disciples and no wise will ever lose his reward. It doesn't have to be big. You don't have to go to Tinbuk2 Africa to get a reward. The two greatest commandments to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and the other love your neighbor as yourself. You can ask anybody, what does it mean to love my neighbor? And you'll get all kinds of answers. What does it mean to love God? Nobody asked that question. What does it mean to love God? So ask that question of yourself when you prepare your baskets, ready to wave them before God. What does it mean to love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might, and which is also all your strength? What does that mean to love God? Very important question that we need to ask ourselves. Shavuot is the fourth moed of the spring appointments. The first one, of course, Passover, unleavened bread, barley first fruits, and then Shavuot. Fourth one of the spring, the last one of the spring. Leviticus 23, 17 says, The priest is to wave two loaves with leaven before the Lord. We'll do that tomorrow too. I'll have two loaves of leavened bread. And I'll also wave that before God too. What does two loaves of leavened bread have to do with anything? Isn't le leaven mean sin? Why are you waving loaves of sin before God? Because we're sinful creatures. God may see us as unleavened because of what his son did, but we are still recognized that we are sinful creatures. And so these bodies, these sinful bodies, will be presented to the Lord. Two loaves, which always means Jew and Gentile. And so these bodies will be, present, be presented to the Lord to be accepted by him. And that's why we wave two loaves of leavened bread. Of course, the scriptures dealing with leaven is always good to know. 1 Corinthians 5, 6-8. Your glory is not good. Know yourself that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Oh, it was just a little sin. Just a little bitty sin. What does leaven do to bread? It turns the entire bread into leavened bread. You put a little leaven in a loaf that does have no leaven, before long the entire loaf is full of leaven. So what God is saying here is, don't excuse yourself even with little sins, because eventually it's going to turn your entire self into a sinful nature. It goes on to say, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. How, how, how about that? You're a lump. <laughs> we are lumps. All that means is dough. <laughs> but I like saying that. We're a lump. But we're a new lump. As you are unleavened. The Apostle Paul says, you are unleavened. Why are we unleavened? Because Yeshua took our sins and our punishment. The one of the laws he certainly did away with was the law of sin and death. The punishment for our wickedness. He took that to him for him on the cross. He died for us. He took that punishment. And that's why God looks at us today and sees us as righteous. We know we're not righteous. Even the Bible says any man who thinks he does not sin is a liar. Read that in 1 John. We're not liars. We know we sin. We know we make mistakes. But thank God, as Paul said, I don't do that which I should, and I do that which I shouldn't. Paul struggled with sin too. But then you can read this in Romans chapter 7 if you want. But he also goes, but thank God for Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said. Thank God for Yeshua HaMashiach, the Christ, the Messiah. Thank God. Even Paul knew that. He needed the Messiah. Even as a believer, he didn't do what he was supposed to do all the time. And we don't either. We don't either. But Paul says, you are unleavened. Christ made us unleavened, which is righteous. But still, Paul says, get the leaven out. 
Get the leaven out. Because it hurts you in the kingdom consequences and the rewards and the positions. Get the leaven out. We've got to get the leaven out. For Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for you. Therefore, keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That's all in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. If Messiah has taken us and cleansed us, we need to walk accordingly. Mark 8, 15. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. The Pharisees were hypocrites. Herod was just a cutthroat, a bad guy. Matthew 16, 6. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Goes on to say that that meant their doctrines when you look that up. Beware of bad doctors. Why do you think I do discipleship classes and teach people? The doctrines of the Lord. He said, beware of the doctrines of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Beware of religious, false religious leaders and their doctrines. This is what it's saying. This is why I taught the things I taught. So we walk in righteousness and understand truth at all times. Very important to understand. And in Galatians 5.9 also says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Again, we talked about that already. Even 1 Corinthians 5 said that. Same thing. So don't be telling yourselves, oh, it's just a little sin. <laughs> it will catch up with you. It always does. Of course, leaven means sin. These loaves indicate the wheat first fruits of Jews and Gentiles and their sinful bodies being presented to the Lord to be accepted by him. It says, fine flour these loaves are supposed to be made out of. Fine flour. Did you know in temple times, they would take flour and beat it and sift it 300 times because of that phrase, fine flour. They want to make sure that flour was the finest they could ever get it. Fine flour beaten 300 times. And then they would bake the two loaves out of that fine flour. What does that mean spiritually to us? Being beaten 300 times, that's indication of persecution and tribulations. Folks, you cannot escape that. To much tribulation you enter the kingdom of God, Acts says. Acts 14 tells you that. To much tribulation you enter the kingdom of God. If you are not facing persecution and hard times, then you better check your belief watch. Because something is out of sync or out of time. It comes with the territory. Yeshua says, they, they hate me, they'll hate you. So either nobody knows you're a believer, or you're not standing firm in your belief. Those kind of things. It comes with the territory. We are unleveled bread, but we are sprinkled with the powder sugar of persecution. It comes with the territory. To count it all as joy, as the Bible says, when you are persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's important to know that. Wow. Wow. Shavuot is his third Sabbath that's not a weekly Sabbath. Did you know there are seven Sabbaths in the year other than weekly Sabbath? Because so many believers do not know that, they really mess up the scriptures. And they come up with wrong concepts. Like Yeshua dying on a Friday night. Being crucified on a Friday night. How do you get three days and three, day, three nights in the tomb if it was a Friday night? You cannot. You cannot get three days, three nights. Where was the mistake? John called it a high Sabbath. That was the first day of unleavened bread, which is the Sabbath. And the seventh day of unleavened bread is the Sabbath. So Yeshua died the night before the first 
Sabbath of unleavened bread, which would have been a Wednesday night, or Wednesday, getting ready to go into Thursday, which would have been the first Sabbath of unleavened bread. From that point, you get three days and three nights in the tomb. It's real simple, but when you chase off your Hebraic roots, because they're trying to put us under the law concept, you miss so much stuff. I, I argued my, with myself over that so many times about how do I get three days and three nights from a Friday night crucifixion? It never adds up. Never. So I said, well, maybe a little of this, a little of that, a little of that. Maybe I can get a little partial three days and three nights out of it. It always works partially if you argue that way on the day, but never the night. So it just never worked. Until I found out there were seven other Sabbaths in the year other than the weekly Sabbath. And John called it a high Sabbath, which was not a weekly Sabbath. So Shavuot is the third Sabbath. Sacrifices were to be offered. Seven lambs, one bull, two rams for a burnt offering. A burnt offering is an ascent offering. A burnt offering, blood offering unto the Lord, a burnt offering. The entire animal is consumed by fire. Nobody eats any part of it. Normally, the priests get part of it or the giver gets part of a sacrifice. Not that one. The whole thing is God's. And it's put on the altar and burned completely before the Lord. And the Bible says it's a sweet-smelling aroma coming up before the nostrils of God. What is who, who and what are burnt offerings? You. You're the burnt offerings. It's you. It's talking about people. You have the ascent offering. You're the one that's going to ascend to him. Doesn't mean you're going to be burnt. It just means that you are totally going to be presented to the Lord. Every aspect of you will be presented to the Lord. That's what a burnt offering is. You are the burnt offering. So not only are you unleavened, you are also a burnt offering. So when it talks about the lambs, seven lambs, that's believers. Lamb means complete, seven means completeness. So it's all the believers is completed. They're going to be presented to God as a burnt offering. It also says one bull and two rams for burnt offerings. Typically a bull is a king or a priest, high priest. Rams are priests. Two rams, and again, indicating Jew and Gentile. We are called kings and priests before the Lord. And some of you heard me say this before. If we are kings, why don't we act like it? If we are priests, why don't we act like it? This is the calling God has put on us. A strong calling God has put on us. Also is a goat for a sin offering and two lambs for sin offerings are also offered. Now Yeshua is also all these offerings especially the sin offering. Yet we see a future concept here. The lambs are believers. you got to understand that. You are lambs. When you look at the book of Enoch, the believers are called lambs or sheep all the time in the book of Enoch. But they are first fruits. This is why it's called the first fruit offering. Shavuot is a first fruit offering. It's not the main harvest. It's only a part of the harvest. The main harvest will be in the fall. This is in the spring. The first fruit offering is in the spring. This feast is also known as the Feast of the Harvest, Exodus 23, 16, and the Feast of Weeks, Deuteronomy 16, 9. In Exodus 23, 19, it says, The scriptures command us to bring the first of the first fruits of the land to the house of the Lord our God. The first of the first fruits. Now, those are two different Hebrew words. First fruits also means firstborn. But that first means beginnings. It's the same word that, that Genesis comes from. Beginnings, best, chief. The best of the first fruits you are to bring 
to the house of our God. This is when we wave the basket. That's what we are symbolizing before God. Receive me into your house, O God. Very, very important. Receive me into the house, O God. It could possibly represent a hierarchy in the kingdom. First fruits also means firstborn. One of these days I'm just going to do a teaching on firstborn. Do you, you know the Bible says the firstborn male is always the Lord's. Then later he changed that to the Levites. He changes the Levites are my firstborn. The Levites never got any land in Israel. Did you know that? They were given Levitical cities, but they received no land. Our promise is not land in Israel. Our promise is the holy city built by the hands of God and not built by the hands of man. That's our promise. Because the Levites were called firstborn, their inheritance was the Lord's. That's what the Bible says when the Levites said, we don't have any land. I am your inheritance. That's what he told the Levites. That's what we say today. God is our inheritance. He even today Yeshua is preparing a place for us in the new Jerusalem. As the Levites got Levitical cities, we will get, in a sense, a Levitical city of the new Jerusalem. Amen? So that ought to, you know, stop people trying to figure out, well, I'm part Jewish, I'm entitled to some land in Israel. Why would you care about that? Why would you care that you're in a, you are right, have a right to inheritance of the land of Israel? Your inheritance is far greater. The physical Jerusalem is a great place to visit, but I want to live in the new Jerusalem. Amen. That's what I want, the new Jerusalem. Not the old I love the old Jerusalem and I pray for the old Jerusalem like God commands. But it's the new Jerusalem we want. With our own little mailbox and picket fence and all that kind of stuff. I'm kidding. I have no idea. The Bible says eyes have not seen nor ears have heard of the things that God has for those who love him. Wow. As many of you know, it was on Pentecost or Shavuot that the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and that began the Messianic movement, also known as the church. 3,000 people got saved that day. Where did this happen where so many people go watch us? I believe that it was, it was the upper le levels of, of the priestly buildings around the Temple Mount. Did you know there were stories along the Temple Mount borders, different rooms upstairs? It was up there where the, where the, where the foyers and, and balconies could overlook the temple area. Shavuot is a pilgrimage feast. Every Jew male must go to Jerusalem on Shavuot. So all the Jews in the entire Roman Empire and everywhere else, Egypt, Assyria, the Mesopotamia area, wherever, they all come to Jerusalem on Shavuot. So you had all these different cultures and languages on the Temple Mount. It was crowded. There was no six foot social distance. They were crowded to shoulder to shoulder on the Temple Mount. Probably could not even all get in the Temple Mount. So there's probably a line in and out constantly trying to get onto the Temple Mount. When the Holy Spirit came down upon the disciples, when it says the upper room, it's got to be those balconies it's talking about. Otherwise, how can tens of thousands of Jews see what was going on. You go in Israel today, there's a room they call the upper room. No, it's not. It's not the biblical upper room. It's a room that somebody designated as being the spot. It's not even near the Temple Mount. How in the world did tens of thousands of Jews see the disciples in that room? They did not. The upper room is the, was like the second level of the houses where a lot of the priests live, that's where it would happen. So when the tongues of fire fell upon the disciples and they began to speak in other tongues, the tens of thousands of Jews on the Temple Mount saw it and looked up going, what is going on? And they heard them speaking in tongues. 
Now, how, how do 10,000 Jews hear 120 disciples speaking their languages? It's physically impossible. But with God, it's not. God opened the ears of the Jews on the Temple Mount where they heard what was being said. So when they begin to speak in tongues, it doesn't mean that they were speaking in foreign languages. They were speaking heavenly languages. But God opened the ears of the Jews on the Temple Mount and they begin to hear the praises of God coming from their lips in their own language. So, who are these Galileans? They're speaking my language from Pathos and Cush and Latin and, and Greek all over the world. We're hearing our language praising God. What's going on? Then Peter stood up. Scaredy cat Peter was now emboldened because of the Holy Spirit. Got up and began to speak. You men of Judea and Israel and all the rest of you Jews, do you not understand? You crucified the Messiah. You killed your Messiah. Peter denied the Lord 50 days before, three times. But now he's up to his boldness, talking out to the Lord. And talking to the tens of thousands of Jews on the Temple Mount that could have rushed him and killed them all for blasphemy if they thought it was that. But no, God was in control. He made sure that wasn't going to happen. And these people heard the words in their own language of praising God. 3,000 people got saved that day. And you know very well, they talked about it a lot after that for a while. Because after a while, Peter and John went to the temple to pray. And there a lame man was sitting, sitting at the gate, the beautiful gate, calling for alms, begging. He was blind. He was lame. And Peter saw him, and this is what Peter said, Gold and silver have I none, but this I have to give to you. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, stand up, rise, and be healed. And the lame man stood up and began to shout, Oh my gosh, I can walk, I can walk. 5,000 Jews got saved that day. So in a very short period of time, 8,000 Jews got saved. Believe that Yeshua was the Messiah. Why aren't we seeing that today? Is it because of fear? Because we're not proclaiming the Lord? Or we're not walking as unleavened bread as we should? Are we afraid to tell people we're believers because they're going to point out something we did wrong, we're ashamed of? Why don't we see those things today? We see them a little bit. We've seen them here a little bit. But not in the numbers that occurred in those early years of the church. He said the church was added to daily. Daily. The church was added to. Many people got healed. Rose from the dead. Lame can walk. Blind can see. The deaf can hear. All these things that Yeshua did, he said, you will do even more. Greater things. He was talking about numbers wise. So all these things the disciples began to do to show that they were the unleavened bread of God. That they were the light of the world. They were the salt of the earth. And you could not hold back. You could not hold back the move of God when that happened. Wow. Did you know that right around Shavuot, probably a little later than Shavuot, 3,000 Jews died, or Israelites died, at Mount Sinai? Because they worshipped a golden calf. This is the time they were hanging around Mount Sinai. Before the 40 year wilderness journey. 3,000 died. See the comparison? Holy Spirit 3,000 got saved. The letter of the law 3,000 died. 
died. The letter of the law kills. Doesn't mean the law is bad. It means when taken improperly, it kills. It turns into legalism. You have to be careful about that. But the Holy Spirit is different. And that's what we seek all the time. By the way, how did those 3,000 Jews die? Or Israelites die? Hebrews die? They what? The Levites killed them. That's correct. Unlike the movie Cecil DeMille's movie Ten Commandments, the ground opens up and swallows them up. That's not what happened. Moses commanded the Levites to take their swords and kill everyone that bowed and kneeled to the golden calf. The Levites obeyed and went out and killed 3,000 Hebrews for their idolatry. Some say, well, you know, it, was just, it was just a golden calf unto God himself. Doesn't matter. You shall have no image before me, the Bible said in the Ten Commandments. They still violated the commandment of God, no matter which way you look at it. So 3,000 Hebrews died at the swords of the Levite. And because of the faithfulness of the Levites and doing that, they now became the firstborn rights of God. Firstborn has inheritance rights. You are firstborn. Do you know, not know that you have inheritance in God? Inheritance in God. That should deserve an amen right there. Amen. amen. You have inheritance of God that no one can take away. Wow. And I say it's possible rapture. We'll talk about a couple of scriptures here. Isaiah 18, verses 3 through 5. This is a little cryptic, so pay close attention. It says, All you inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, look, behold, he lifts up an ensign on the mountains. That's talking about the sign of the Son of Man. That's what that's talking about. The ensign means sign. He lifts it up. When it talks about up on top of a mountain, it means high in the sky. That's what it's talking about when it says mountain of God or high in the mountain. It's not talking about Mount Everest. It's not even talking about the San Francisco peaks. It's not talking about that. It's talking about up there, high in the sky. When the sign appears is what Isaiah is saying. And when he blows a trumpet, we read that in Thessalonians too, when the trumpet blows. Hear you, that's Shema, which is hear, obey, and understand. It says, understand what I'm trying to say, what Isaiah is saying, he's trying to say. When the sign appears and the trumpet blows, listen to what I'm telling you what's going to happen. Then we go to verse 4. For so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest. This way, when I teach on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first day is the Sabbath, the seventh day is the Sabbath. It's a seven-day feast. The day you believed was that first Sabbath. The day you go be with the Lord is the seventh Sabbath. That's what seven means, complete. The completeness of your life. The day you believe started a new life where you take your rest, where every day of your life is the Sabbath. And on the seventh day, when you get called home, you get your final rest. That's what we're talking about here. For the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest, and I will consider, which means regard, look, behold, look down, look about, in my dwelling place. So basically what Isaiah is saying, I will look at my body. I'm looking at my dwelling place. Your body is your dwelling place. It's also the temple of the Lord, because you have the Holy Spirit. You have the temple of the Lord. So you're looking at yourself. And it'd be like a clear heat. That word clear is white, dazzling, bright. It's not clear, clear. It's white, dazzling, bright. Isaiah is talking about his garments of light he will receive at the rapture. That's what he's talking about. This is where it gets a little encrypted right here. Upon herbs. What? <laughs> Upon herbs. 
That Hebrew word in the Bible is used a lot, and there are only three places that the translators translate it like a plant, herb. That's not, that was a poor translation. That word herb also means light, lightning, sun, brightness of countenance. So what Isaiah is saying, I will consider my body, and now look, I become dazzling white countenance. That's what he's saying. He's talking about his garments of light that we are promised as a gift of God. Isaiah saw himself this way. And like a cloud of dew or mist in the heat of the harvest. In other words, he's saying, my, it'd be like a, my aurora around me. Be like a garment of light. I will shine. All around me will be a garment of light. Like the aurora, like you see, you know, up north. If you're up there in Alaska, you see the aurora uh, in the sky. And all the different colors show up in the sky. That's what Isaiah is talking about. This light, this brilliance of light that flashes through the sky. We're going to have that. We're going to have that. Verse 5. For before the harvest, when the bud, for before, before the harvest, when the bud, which is flower, or means also flower or sprout, is perfect, that means upright, accomplished, finished, at an end, and the sour grape, which means unripe grapes, is ripening in the flower. He shall both cut off the sprigs with the pruning hooks and take away and cut down the branches. It tells you a time frame right there. When the bud is in the flower of the grape, or at least down to the point where the little green grapes are beginning to form. That's when all this is going to happen, Isaiah is talking about. When does that happen? The grapevine buds begin around mid-March. 50 to 80 days later, they bloom in May. This would be around Shava Oat. The first fruits rapture will occur in the spring, not the fall. A general harvest will happen in the fall, but not the first fruits. You want to be in first fruits. You want to be part of the. You want to be the first of the first fruits. You want to be the best, the best choice of the first fruits. And that's when that will occur. This is also very similar to the Song of Solomon, chapter two, verses eleven through thirteen. For lo, winter is past. Winter is already past. We're in spring. Rain is over and gone. Yeah, the winter rains are over. The same way as Israel. The winter rains are over. The flowers appear on the earth and the time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. And the fig tree puts forth her green figs and the vines, the tender grapes, that's blossoms, and give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, which means my beautiful one, and come away. That's a rapture concept. In the spring, right around Shavuot, the Song of Solomon is talking about the bride of the Messiah. That's what Songs of Solomon is all about, is the bride of the Messiah. He calls you, my beautiful one, come away. The parable of the ten virgins, the bridegroom shout is going to occur, and five were ready. And they went to the Messiah. The Messiah didn't come to them. They went to the Messiah. The call went. And the door was open. And they went. That's a rapture concept. Messiah didn't come. They went to him. Many times in the Bible when it talked about the Messiah coming. Check that word out in Greek. And you will see that another definition that is appearing. Most of those when the Messiah appears. That's the sign of the Son of Man. When the sign of the Son of Man appears, know you right away that the rapture is at hand. It's going to take place. So don't believe these yahoos that say the rapture is getting ready to occur. This, this, this. Where's the sign? Where's the sign of the Son of Man? I don't know how long the sign will be up to before the rapture occurs, but I don't think it'll be very long. When that sign appears, be like the five wise virgins. Light your lamps trim your laps. Then you can start practicing your rapture jumps. I'm being silly. Because when it happens, there is no jumping. You'll be translated like immediately. Wow. It'll be the wheat first fruits. The barley first fruits has already been raptured. 
We're waiting on the wheat first fruits. The barley was in the spring at the resurrection of our Lord. And now we're waiting for the wheat first fruits to take place. Remember, first fruits is just a part of a large harvest, of the general harvest. We are first fruits people. The Lord calls us his beautiful ones. Don't ever let anybody tell you you're not beautiful. You are beautiful in the eyes of God. You are his. That's why the scripture says, the Lord delights in the death of his saints. Well, that sounds kind of morbid. But it's true. The Lord delights in the death of his saints. He so long wants to be with us and to join with us and to love on us and to hug us. If he can even do that, I don't know. Probably. Yeshua rose to heaven in an incorruptible body. He still has that incorruptible body. So I imagine he can eat and drink wine, as the Bible says, and hug us too. And dance with us. Yay! Ask him that the first time you see him. Lord, would you dance with me? What do you think he'll say? Yes! I long to dance with you. I long to hold you. I long to hold your hands and walk with you. Sit with you. Eat with you. Drink with you. I will certainly dance with you. Amen? Amen. This is what Shavuot is all about, folks. I can't tell you the rapture is going to occur on Shavuot. But it will probably be in this season. It will probably be in this season. I know it's not going to happen tomorrow. Because there are certain things not fulfilled yet. But keep it in mind, every time we approach this season, if those other things start appearing, the sign of the Son of Man, the temple in Jerusalem is built, the beast of revelation is on the earth, tremendous amount of persecution of believers has taken place, then I would say, when Javo comes around, get ready. Get ready at that time. Amen? God bless everybody. Let's, let's get our offerings out. Let's hold them up. Oh, we're gonna do. A, we're gonna pray over this, and then we're gonna, we got the new covenant Passover too, folks. We have a little bit different way of doing it. You're gonna see that your 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 bread is uh, in a little baggie. Elder Brahita did that for us. She put them in little baggies. Hey, Brahita! Yay! That way, nobody's fingers are in there doing this and <laughs> trying to get a piece of bread. It was a good idea. So let's pray over the offering, folks. Father God, we just bless you and thank you, Lord, for all you have given unto us. We thank you, Lord. We magnify your name. You're our God, Lord. And Lord, I just ask you to bless these tithes and offerings and multiply back to those who give many times, Lord God, that they will flourish and all their needs will be met. In Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Okay, so we know the routine. Let's come up through here. And you can split and go this way or that way. Kind of keep a distance from one another unless you're a part of a family. That's okay. I know you don't do that at home. <laughs>
we call this new covenant Passover. Communion's okay too. But there's a reason we call it new covenant Passover. That's when Yeshua instituted it. At the Last Supper with his disciples. You must remember, bread and wine was part of the sacrificial system. When it offered sacrifices, they would pour wine and meal with the sacrifice. So what Yeshua was showing them was he was the sacrifice. He was the sacrifice. They were doing the mincha, they call it. And they, they, were, they were, so the meal and the wine was given to the disciples in remembrance of him that he is, in fact, our sacrifice. He, in fact, made us unleavened bread. Did away with our sins. The law of sin and death has been destroyed because of him. The law is not gone, but that aspect was. Thank God it was. Or none of us would survive. Amen? Amen. So when he held up the bread, he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given unto you. And then he blessed God, not the bread. He blessed God for the bread. So join with me in the traditional blessing of the bread. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamoti Lechem Min Haaretz Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, <coughs> who brings forth bread from the earth and reminds us that Yeshua is the bread of life. Partake. That's so good. Yeshua is so good. <laughs> Likewise, he held up the cup. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant I make with you. And he blessed God for the cup. He didn't bless the cup. He blessed God for the cup. So join with me in the traditional Hebrew blessing over the cup. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Peri Agafin Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Remind us that Yeshua is the first fruit. Partake. Lahaim. Amen. Amen. Let's do some worship. <laughs> 